If you think the big three prestigious German brands have the executive car segment sewn up, a drive in Jaguar's second generation XF may be enough to make you reconsider. Even in the face of tough competition from rivals like the BMW 5 Series, the Mercedes E-Class and the Audi A6, this car offers a compelling range of virtues, with a choice of saloon or sport break estate body styles, and impressive levels of quality and connectivity. Perhaps most significantly, this Mark II model's aluminium intensive architecture provides for weight savings that have delivered sharp handling and very competitive levels of efficiency. In short, it's a very complete package. The Jaguar XF was the car that, when it was launched back in 2007, turned around its maker's fortunes, proving that the Coventry company could credibly compete with its German rivals in the premium segment for full-sized executive models. This second-generation version of that car, though, showed us how the brand planned to go about beating them. It was first launched as a saloon in 2015, then the range was expanded in 2017 to include this Sport Brake estate version. With this improved XF260 series design, a styling evolution hit a product revolution. All versions of this Mark II XF model being lighter, more efficient and more technologically sophisticated than before. An improvement on their predecessors in every possible respect. Now the exterior dimensions might be slightly more compact than those of the Mark I version, but they disguise a longer wheelbase which has allowed the high-tech aluminium intensive architecture to clothe a much more spacious cabin, especially for rear seat folk. Now we're taking another look at this second generation XF model because, as we referenced earlier, much has changed about it since the original launch, not least the introduction of the additional sport brake estate body style that we've chosen to test today. Much is different beneath the bonnet too. Jaguar's modern era Ingenium four-cylinder two-litre engine technology was only available in 163 and 180 PS diesel form at launch. Now there's an extra twin turbo 240 PS diesel and a pair of Ingenium petrol units, putting out either 250 or 300 PS. Across the range, media connectivity and safety technology have taken a big step forward too. What hasn't changed though is the XF's remit as a more sporting, dynamic choice in the full-sized executive segment. And now to put that into competitive context, it's more BMW 5 Series than Audi A6 or Mercedes E-Class, although buyers of all three of those rival models could be tempted by this Jaguar's classy cabin technology and its unbettered standards of refinement and ride quality. In short, it's more than ready to take on this segment in earnest, with what looks to be an elegant, progressive display of British engineering and craftsmanship. How will it fare? Let's find out. Customers in the executive sector for larger models often select their cars based on efficiency and balance sheet performance. Here's one though that business buyers might be tempted towards for other reasons. A car you might choose for the way it makes you feel before indeed you've even gone anywhere. Now if you haven't tried an XF before, then let's try to give you a sense of the experience on offer. Get in and on entry, the start button pulses red like a heartbeat. Press it and on an automatic model like this one, the Jaguar Drive gearbox selector rises into the palm of your hand uh, while rotating air conditioning vents at the outer edges of the fascia somersault into action. It's really quite a performance. But there needs to be more substance to what this XF can offer if it's going to be a really credible alternative to its German segment rivals. Unfortunately, there is. Now, we've uh, talked elsewhere in this film about the first generation version of this car being instrumental in turning around Jaguar's fortunes. Well, another milestone in that regard was marked by the introduction of a mainstream engine range that was at last the company's own, the so-called Ingenium branded range of two litre petrol and diesel units. When this Mark II XF260 series model first arrived back in 2015, Jaguar had only shown us two of these, uh, the single turbo 163 and 180 PS diesels. Now though, there's also a twin turbo 240 PS diesel and a range of two Ingenium petrol power plants too, slotting beneath the 
petrol and diesel V6s at the top of the range. Add to this the introduction of all-wheel drive with certain engines and the availability of the alternative sport brake estate body style that we've chosen for this test and you can see why we think the XF to be a far more complete product these days but still a very desirable one primarily because of the thing that we most liked about this car when we first tested it. It's beautifully judged ride and handling balance. Credit for this goes to a clever rear suspension system. It's called Integral Link. That's an alternative to the more usual multi-link setups that most rivals use. Now this setup's better because it's allowed Jaguar's engineers far more scope in tuning this car's lateral and longitudinal stiffness, which means that on the move, lateral and longitudinal body movements can be intelligently managed in a way that gives you torque body control when you want it and a beautifully relaxing ride when you don't. Now we found the standard setup so effective that if we were buying this car, we might question the need to spend more on the optional Adaptive Dynamics adjustable damping system that your dealer will want to tell you about. Now this monitors body movements 500 times a second so as to always automatically set the car up precisely for the road you're on and the mood you're in. More powerful XF variants offer the option of upgrading this system to what Jaguar calls configurable dynamic status, at which point those who really like their driving will be pleased to find throttle mapping, gear shift changes, uh, steering fill and adaptive dynamics uh, damper settings all individually tailorable via the in-control infotainment touchscreen and allows them to set up their XF to suit their own personal preferences. For most buyers though, the Jaguar Drive Control driving mode system that all XF models get as standard will be quite sufficient. Now the included setup doesn't give you any of the fancy suspension adaptability that you'd be paying extra for with those systems that I've just been describing, but it does allow you to alter the throttle response, the steering feel, and on an automatic model like this one, the auto gear shift change timings dependent on the way that you want to drive. Uh, simply make your choice between the various modes provided by this rather fiddly buttons down here by the gear selector. Uh, normal and eco are fairly self-explanatory while dynamic sharpens the car up nicely and bathes the instruments ahead of you in a potent shade of red. Uh, there is also an extra winter option that on the automatic models activates a clever ASPC all surface progress control system for extra traction at low speeds on slippery surfaces like snow. ASPC works between 2 and 19 miles an hour and it's activated by pressing a button on the centre console after which the driver uses the cruise control switches on the steering wheel to set the required speed. Uh, now so effective is this setup that you may not feel the need to pay extra for the all-wheel drive system which is optional with the 180 PS diesel version and standard on the most powerful four-cylinder models. But all-wheel drive will remain a tempting option for those who live beyond the city limits and it's a package that uses Jaguar IDD, Intelligent Driveline Dynamics Technology, to deliver rear drive handling with 4x4 style performance and tractional benefits. An optional adaptive surface response mode can be built into that IDD system to adapt the mapping of the engine, the transmission, uh, the steering and the stability control to suit the surface that you're on. So, the electronics are made to measure, so too is the steering, which when we first tested the Mark II XF was an area in which we feared it might disappoint given it switched to an electrically powered rack. Actually, the setup's very good. It offers all the sensitivity and feel that you could ask for. Uh, it delivers all the confidence that you need to exploit the perfect rear-orientated balance you get from this car when you're pressing on through tighter corners. And also helping here is the perfect near 50-50 weight distribution and a body that's very torsionally rigid thanks to its adoption of cutting-edge aluminium intensive architecture. In addition, XF drivers benefit from the standard inclusion of a torque vectoring by braking setup, which as you enter a bend, lightly brakes the inner wheels to reduce understeer and to keep the car precisely on the line you've chosen. On to engines, which uh, in most cases with this car will be the Ingenium four-cylinder two-litre units we referred to earlier. Uh, things kick off with the 163 and 180 PS diesel variants. Now those are the only power parts in the range that you'll be able to make with manual transmission, although almost nobody does. Instead, XF buyers prefer the ZF eight-speed auto, which is used across the range and which delivers the smooth, seamless changes that better suit this Jaguar's elegant character. 
twist the gear selector to S for a more dynamic demeanor or take charge of the changes itself via the provided steering wheel paddles and rest to 60 miles an hour in the base 163 PS auto model occupies 8.6 seconds en route to 132 miles an hour uh, figures that the 180 PS variant improved to 7.9 seconds and 136 mph. Now, if you can stretch to the twin turbo 240 PS diesel all wheel drive model, you're looking at 6.5 seconds and 153 miles an hour. Beyond that lies the, the variant we've selected for this test, the V6 3 litre diesel, which comes only with rear wheel drive, offering 300 PS and a potent 700 Newton metres of torque. That is enough to power it to 60 miles an hour in 5.6 seconds on the way to a top speed of 155 miles an hour. But perhaps, given the current eco-climate, you'd prefer petrol power. Well, if so, your options only come with auto transmission and they kick off with a rear-driven 250 PS variant capable of 62 miles an hour and 6.4 seconds en route to 152. Um, ideally, though, you want the 300 PS unit that's borrowed from Jaguar's F-Type sports car, which is fitted out with all-wheel drive and makes 62 in 5.6 seconds on the way to 155 miles an hour. Ultimately though, XF motoring is really about lowering your heartbeat rather than raising it. And if that's the kind of cultured driving experience that you'd like, then we think you'll enjoy this Jaguar very much indeed. From almost any angle, you'd know this was a Jaguar, you'd know it was an XF. This second generation XF260 series model features a lower roof line than its predecessor, and in saloon form, the rear deck is longer and higher. Arguably even better looking though, is the Sport Break Estate version that we've chosen to try here. A shape where every star line serves a clear purpose, creating a fast, sweeping silhouette. Get up close and personal and you might notice the long aluminium bonnet's potent power bulge. That's apparently a nod to the brand's classic XJ6 model of 1968. Uh, you might also pick up on the way that this mesh front grille is more vertical than was the case with the first generation design. And that delivers a more mature look. That's echoed by flush fitting headlights that uh, can feature adaptive full LED technology and which also incorporate Jaguar's signature J-Blade LED daytime running lights. It's in profile though that perhaps you learn most about the change in design approach which characterizes this Mark II XF model. Not necessarily from the detail aesthetics, although they are quite neat, with lower and mid-height creases which add shape to the flanks, the latter line flowing back from this smart side power vent. Uh, the front and rear overhangs are notably short and the wheel sizes vary from 17 to 20 inches. Uh, we've got the nine split spoke 20 inches here. The brand is particularly proud of the fact that this whole side section is constructed from a single pressing, not a join or a weld in sight. And that's a unique achievement given its fabrication from lightweight aluminium. In fact, over 75% of this car is aluminium based. And at the back, well, as we've already suggested, we think this Sport Break Estate is the more eye-catching of the two available body shapes. Its additional volume is used to accentuate the length and elegance of the original design. Uh, the tapered roof line finishes with this sculpted spoiler and the single piece polymer tailgate features sleek wraparound F-type sports car derived LED tail lamps with their familiar half Randall motif. Now they're connected with this central strip, which is chromed on some models and blacked out on others. And that's there to uh, emphasize this sport brake variant's width. Now a seat in the front of an XF has always been a special experience. If you ever tried the first generation model, what you'll probably remember most is the way that the startup sequence brought the car to life as the rotary gear selector rose up from the center console and the air vents rotated into position. I mean, creating this XF260 series second generation model, the brief was to retain a real sense of occasion, but to mature and simplify the design language a little. So there's a classier, more modern look, as Jaguar's designers have sought to find more interesting and contemporary ways to say luxury. Largely, their efforts seem to have worked. Uh, the rising circular gear selector remains on the automatic models, and so do the cartwheeling air vents, although they've been reduced in number and they've been thrown to the edges of the cabin, with the center of the fascia now freed up for this 10.2-inch in-control touch pro infotainment system. 
Now this setup is certainly a vast improvement on the smaller, lower tech displays of previous models in both form and function. We do continue to be a bit surprised that Jaguar chooses not to provide the kind of separate lower infotainment controller that direct executive segment rivals offer, uh, perhaps because of the possible confusion that this might have created with the similar looking rotary gear selector we mentioned earlier. Now this means that uh, commands that you can't input via the steering wheel buttons have to be submitted Submitted via the often inexact process of voice control if you don't want to end up stabbing away at the touchscreen and covering it with fingerprints. To be fair though, the system's screen and voice functionality do work well, and the setup's general layout and ease of use is well thought out. Uh, the graphics and the depth of content on offer though still can't rival what you'll find in most premium competitor infotainment setups. InControl Pro is your access point not only to the expected audio, climate, uh, telephone and informational functions, but also to an advanced predictive navigation setup, in-car Wi-Fi and a 10 gigabyte hard drive, plus a whole suite of InControl connected car technologies, including an InControl apps feature which allows you to select from a whole series of downloadable compatible applications. Now that's just as well because Rather unfathomably, Jaguar Land Rover doesn't offer Apple CarPlay or Android Auto smartphone mirroring access in any of its models. The navigation system is very clever though. Uh, a commute mode learns your daily drive so it can offer automatic uh, alternative routes based on real-time traffic information. An arrival mode shows a 360 degree interactive view of your destination when you're 200 meters away from it, as well as suggesting the nearest available parking spaces. And a Share ETA function also enables you to notify selected contacts of your arrival time by SMS or email. Getting comfortable is easy, although entry-level variants require manual fore and aft seat adjustment, and through the leather-stitched three-spoke multifunction steering wheel, you view either a deeply cowled set of dials separated by a neat driver information display, or, as is the current fashion, an optional configurable TFT virtual instrument display that in this case is 12.3 inches in size, and pretty much the same as the one you'll find in Jaguar's larger XJ saloon. Uh, get settled, and as you look around, the height of the waistline and the centre console gives the safe, driver-focused feeling of being sat in the beautifully supported leather seat rather than on it. At the same time, the strong horizontal theme of the instrument panel, the layering of it, and the materials used for each layer creates the kind of rich, luxurious, handcrafted ambiance that you just don't get in this car's Teutonic rivals. Now, just one example of this, what Jaguar calls the Reaver Hoop, which is named after the famous powerboat, this veneered strip that sweeps from the doors right around behind the dashboard, and that, on plusher models, can be coated with exquisite stitched leather. Other issues? Uh, well, not many. The drive mode switches for the Jaguar drive control system near the gear controller here are a bit small, while on the doors the seat memory buttons fall to hand more easily than the window switches. Some might find the finish of the soft touch dashboard plastic a little coarse. Uh, we haven't liked the plasticky feel of the steering wheel gear shift paddles, and if you look really hard, say at the bottom of the doors, you might find that a few cheaper materials have been used too. Uh, other than that though, there's very little grouse about, unless you're looking for copious amounts of interior storage space. Uh, the door bins and the glove box aren't very large, but you do get a rubber-backed well in front of the gear selector. Uh, there's no roof-mounted sunglasses holder. Uh, there's a pair of uh, cup holders concealed under the sliding centre console and a hinged armrest that rises to reveal a couple of USB ports and a 12-volt charging point. So, time to take a seat in the back. Now, if your only previous experience of XF motoring happens to have been of the previous first generation XF250 series model, then Jaguar promises you'll notice a big difference back here, thanks to this Mark II version's 51mm wheelbase increase. Sure enough, the room you get for head, legs, elbows and knees is of a different order to what was delivered before. Although all this has really done is to bring this XF up to the prevailing standard in this regard. Uh, the previous model really had no more room on the back seat than you would have got from a car in the next class down. 
Even now, three adults will still need to be on fairly personable terms, but two will be very comfortable indeed. Now, if you're looking for a reason to pay the relatively small premium that Jaguar is charging to buy this XF rather than its smaller XE model, which really is small in the back, uh, then we reckon you've got that right here. The extra glass area gives the rear of the car a less claustrophobic feel too. Now, talking of glass area, on this sport brake, we've got the huge optional panoramic glass roof fitted. It's one of the largest of its kind in the segment, and it can be specified with an electric sunblind, which can be operated by gesture control. So let's take a look in the boot. Now the uh, saloon gives you a 540 litre trunk. So if you go for this sport brake estate body style, you might reasonably be expecting the capacity to be quite a lot larger. Actually, the figure is 565 litres, although the space available is squarer and more usable than a conventional boot area would be. Uh, in capacity terms, it's also pretty class competitive. Yes, it is way off what's provided by the squarical Mercedes E-Class estate, but it is around about the same as what's on offer in a BMW 5 Series Touring, and it's actually slightly more than you'll get in the Volvo V90. Jaguar claims that a family-sized fridge freezer slots in quite comfortably, and perhaps more relevantly, that a golf bag can be accommodated uh, across the width of this area without removing the clubs. Four tie-down points allow large items to be secured and flush-mounted rails in the floor accommodate a variety of optional load restraint fixings. A load cover uh, protects valuable items from prying eyes and an optional divider net is available to restrain loose items to securing points in the roof lining, which, by the way, is where the rear stereo speakers have been recited too, and that's another really neat touch. Possibly our favourite lifestyle design feature, though, is the optional activity key and that's a very useful thing to have because you can wear it just like a watch yet open and lock the car just by presenting it to the tailgate now that'll be ideal for those who use this car for various outdoor pursuits uh, if you need more room but you still need to carry a couple of rear seated passengers then you'll be pleased to see that the rear bench has a central split so that long items like skis can be pushed through now, if you need to flatten everything, you can use these discrete levers, which are positioned just inside these flush cargo side panels or controls on the seat backs themselves, all of which frees up 1,700 litres of completely flat loading space. Now, let's finish with a word about this Sport Map Models tailgate, which, as you saw earlier, is powered as standard, with opening that can be preset to different height limits to suit low roof parking areas like multi-storey car parks and domestic garages. Now, you can also specify the hatch with gesture control so that it raises with a wave of your foot beneath the bumper should you be uh, approaching the car uh, laden down with bags with the key in your pocket. XF pricing begins from around £34,000, which is a couple of thousand below the typical starting point for models in the full executive segment. This car quickly gets with the programme in that regard, though. Most models are priced in the £37,000 to £45,000 bracket, and a V6 diesel, like the one we're trying here, edges up to and beyond the £50,000 price point. Uh, there's a premium of just over £2,700 to pay if you want this sport brake estate body style rather than the four-door saloon. And there are four standard trim options. Prestige, R Sport, Portfolio and S, which is the spec level that we have here. In engine terms, there are really three levels to this Jaguar model's lineup, uh, with the first of these, which incorporates the various mainstream Ingenium four-cylinder two-litre power plants, accounting for nearly all XF sales. Uh, now, nearly all of those are covered off by the 163 and 180 PS diesel variants, the only derivatives in the range that can be ordered with a manual gearbox. Uh, most buyers, though, ignore that and opt to pay £1,750 more for the eight-speed auto transmission, which is standard standard across the rest of the lineup. So think in terms of needing around £37,000 for a typical 180 PS diesel auto variant with base trim and a very limited number of well-chosen extras. That's a realistic starting ballpark figure for pricing. That 180 PS diesel model can be had with optional all-wheel drive for £1,800 more. If you prefer to fuel from the green pump, the least expensive petrol model offers a 250 PS rear-wheel driven package which also uses the four-cylinder two-litre Ingenium configuration and um, which costs from just over £38,000. 
If you're able to justify a spend in the 40 to 45,000 pram bracket in consideration of this XF, uh, you may want to look at one of the more powerful twin turbo Ingenium four cylinder variants. And now there are two, both fitted as standard with all wheel drive. The 240 PS diesel will be the default option for most. But if running costs aren't such an issue, the 300 PS petrol unit that's borrowed from the F type sports car is a tempting choice. Uh, finally, if you can push your spend up to around 50,000 pounds, the third and final rung on the XF ownership ladder. Uh, that's occupied by the three litre V6 diesel variants, one of which we're trying here. Okay, the output of this six cylinder unit, 300 PS, is the same as that of the top four cylinder petrol derivative, uh, but the torque produced is vastly more, 700 newton meters, and that's enough to simply hurl you at the horizon. It's a perfect partner for this car. Uh, enough on the range structure. Let's look at the value proposition that pricing represents. And let's do that firstly by positioning this XF within Jaguar's own lineup. Now, we were surprised to find this model priced so closely to its smaller XE saloon stablemate. An XF might well cost you no more than around £1,300 more than an equivalently spec'd, equivalently trimmed XE. We know which one we'd choose, and we really suspect a significant number of business buyers will also prefer to for this larger car. You have to have the XF, of course, to get this sport brake estate body style. And if you want it, then you'll have decided to ignore the rather similar option that Jaguar already offers for much the same kind of money. It's higher riding and arguably more fashionable F-Pace mid-sized SUV. Uh, the F-Pace vastly outsells the XF sport brake, of course, and an equivalently spec'd, equivalently trimmed version of that SUV will save you about 1500 pounds over a comparable example of this XF estate. Uh, those who choose uh, this station wagon variant though will do that because it looks, feels and drives much more the way a traditional Jaguar should. Well, what about rivals from other brands? Well, earlier we talked about the kind of typical XF variant that most customers choose, a 180 PS four-cylinder diesel automatic. So let's compare the market using one of those as our benchmark. A rival BMW 5 Series, Mercedes E-Class and Audi A6 would all cost you about £1,000 or more extra. The Volvo S90 V90 models would cost only fractionally less than this Jag in comparable form. And less credible entries in this sector, like the Infiniti Q70 and the Lexus ES, wouldn't save you much either. Further up the Jaguar model lineup, six cylinder V6 diesel XF variants like this one are, to be frank, somewhat harder to justify. The three litre engine is a lovely thing to use, but it struggles against two particular six cylinder rivals, the BMW 530D and the Audi A650 TDI, which offer better performance and efficiency for a lot less money. What's important though, is that Jaguar has delivered volume four cylinder versions of this car with a strong price, efficiency and value proposition. Now, if you agree, you you're going to want to know just how generous the British brand has been when it comes to standard equipment. So let's see. Even with entry-level prestige trim, all XF models get supple leather upholstery for the seats and the steering wheel, plus satellite navigation and bi-function xenon headlamps. In addition, your XF will come with pretty much all the usual executive segment niceties you'd expect to find on the car of this class. That means things like alloy wheels of at least 17 inches in size, headlamp washers, auto headlamps and wipers, uh, rear parking sensors, an alarm immobilizer, LED rear tail lamps, and hill launch assist to stop you from drifting backwards on uphill junctions. Inside there's dual zone climate control, Bluetooth phone connectivity, a smart key system with keyless start, heated front seats, an auto dimming rear view mirror, interior ambient lighting, uh, plus there's cruise control with an automatic speed limiter to help you to keep your license through roadworks or urban areas. Classy touches that are these days standard across the range include a suede cloth headliner, bright metal pedals and illuminated metal tread plates with Jaguar script. Uh, the Sport Brake Estate Body Style gets a standard powered tailgate, roof rails and rear self-leveling air suspension too. Now we're pleased to note an improvement in infotainment since the last time we tested this car. All XF models now get Jaguar's much improved in control touch pro setup with its 10.2 inch touchscreen. Now this is what the brand calls a personal command center via which you can access the standard eight speaker Jaguar sound system with its DAB digital radio along with the climate control and the navigation functionality. Uh, there's voice control of course and Bluetooth streaming, the usual USB, aux in, 
in an iPod connectivity and an in-control Wi-Fi system, which creates in your car a mobile 3G Wi-Fi hotspot into which you can connect up to eight devices. Uh, the in-control Touch Pro package includes a 10 gigabyte hard drive for your personal media, plus a clever predictive navigation system, which learns your regular journeys and displays your expected ETA without you having to enter a destination. And we also like the approach mode that shows a 360 degree interactive view of your destination when you're still 200 meters away from it while advising you of the nearest available car parking spaces. Uh, you also get an in-control apps feature, which allows you to select from a whole series of downloadable compatible apps, uh, which will make it easy to do anything from making a conference call to finding a parking space or booking a hotel room. Uh, you can connect Apple and Android devices into the system with a USB cable, but surprisingly, the system's not compatible with the Apple CarPlay and Android Auto smartphone mirroring technology that rivals do offer. Uh, talking of smartphones, as is common these days with modern models in this segment, you'll be able to remotely monitor your XF from your handset via Jaguar's in-control remote premium technology, via which you can monitor your fuel level and your driving range, you can get help in finding your car in a crowded car park, and you can even check if you've left the doors, the windows or the sunroof open. Uh, there's also the option to download mileages from business trips to make claiming expenses quicker and easier. And you can even preset the climate control from wherever you are to cool or warm the cabin before you get into it. There are plenty of standard dynamic driving aids too, so on the move you'll benefit from the Jaguar Drive Control System that via various settings allows you to tweak the steering and the throttle response to suit the way that you want to drive. Uh, gear change timings too if, like most buyers, you've opted for automatic transmission. Uh, cornering tractions aided by a torque vectoring by braking setup, plus automatic variants get a clever all-surface progress control system for extra traction at low speeds on slippery surfaces. Plenty included as standard then. Still, that won't stop a significant number of buyers being tempted to find an extra couple of thousand to get themselves the sportier looking R Sport trim level. Now you do, after all in this guise, get a more potent looking XF thanks to the addition of a sports front bumper, side sills, a rear spoiler, satin chrome side power vents and gloss black window surrounds. Larger 18 inch alloys too if you avoid the base 163 PS diesel engine. Bear in mind that the R Sport variants get stiffer sports suspension though, which you might like to try before you buy. We much prefer the suppler standard setup. Inside an R Sport XF model, the more dynamic theme continues with sports seats and sports pedals, along with branding for the door sills and the steering wheel. Are there any key standard equipment emissions with the mainstream Prestige and R Sport trim levels? Well, not many. As with this model's German rivals, there is the annoyance that you have to make do with a tyre repair kit rather than a proper space saver spare wheel. And in this day and age, you might not expect to have to pay extra to cool the glove box or to get an air quality sensor. And there's also the irritation that saloon versions of these volume models don't give you the convenience of a split folding rear backrest. That's something that's only included as standard with range-topping portfolio trim. You have to ascend to pricey portfolio trim if you're going to get yourself what are now relatively familiar niceties on plusher cars these days. Uh, things like power folding mirrors, keyless entry, a heated front windscreen, a reverse parking camera and front parking sensors. Portfolio models additionally include softer grain Windsor leather for the seats that at the front are 10-way adjustable electrically powered items. Uh, this trim level also gets you a leather-wrapped upper fascia and a powerful 11-speaker 300 180 watt Meridian sound system. Beyond portfolio trim, there's only the top most dynamic S spec that we're trying here, and that's available only with the V6 diesel engine. Here, in addition to all the portfolio items, you get 19 inch wheels with red calipers, various sporty trimming embellishments, and a 380 watt 11 speaker Meridian sound system. S models also get adaptive dynamics, adaptive suspension, and a configurable dynamic system, which allows you to specifically tailor the drive setup of your XF. 
It is worth saying a bit more about adaptive dynamics and configurable dynamics because these systems are key options for buyers of lower spec variants who avoid the least powerful diesel engine. Now where the standard Jaguar drive control system can, as we said earlier, tweak steering, gear change and throttle response to the way that you want to drive, adding adaptive dynamics into the package means that the suspension is also automatically tweaked too. Now sensors analyze body roll and wheel movement 500 times a second Second, ensuring that the suspension should always be perfectly suited to the way that you want to drive. Want to go even further? Well, if you do, uh, the configurable dynamic system will allow you to individually tailor your car's throttle mapping, its gear shift changes, its steering fill, and the adaptive dynamics damper settings using the In Control Pro infotainment touchscreen. Now, that is one for the enthusiasts only, though, we think. Now, since we've got onto options, let's move on to talk you through the various extra cost additions that you might like to make when you're specifying your XF. And it certainly makes sense to buy in lower down the lineup and add in the particular features that you want. There's plenty on the lengthy extras list to catch your eye, but possibly the most significant item on offer is the package which gives you the 12.3 inch virtual instrument display borrowed from Jaguar's larger XJ model and an uprated Meridian sound system with either 380 or 800 25 watts of output. Uh, you might also want to pay extra to embellish the 10.2 inch center dash touch pro screen with Jaguar's impressive dual view technology. Now this allows front seat passengers to watch different things on the same monitor. So for example, the driver can check the sat nav while the passenger enjoys a movie. As for other key extra cost features, well, on the Sport Brake model, we'd ideally like the big panoramic glass roof that we've been trying here, to which you can also add an electric blind, which can be specified to operate with gesture control. And we'd also want the clever activity key, which you can wear just like a watch, yet open and lock the car just by pressing it to the tailgate. Uh, that'll be ideal for those using this car for various outdoor pursuits. Cabin air ionization to purify the interior atmosphere is also optional with this estate body style. There are uh, some optional driver orientated features to highlight too. The head up display, for example, which projects key driving information into your line of sight onto the bottom of the windscreen. And that will, uh, with this feature, have an infrared anti-reflective coating. Also quite popular amongst XF buyers is the advanced park assist pack, which has auto functionality that can find your ideal parking bay and then steer you into it, and which can be ordered with the 360 degree surround view camera system. Further options include Include adaptive LED headlamps which turn with the bends and which dip themselves in the face of oncoming traffic at night. And while we're on the driving stuff, uh, let's mention the uprated 350 millimeter brakes and the fact that if you go for an all wheel drive model, then you really should pay the small amount extra to get that 4x4 setup fitted out with Jaguar's optional adaptive surface response system, which adapts the mapping of the engine, the transmission, the steering and the stability control to suit the surface that you're on. Uh, what else? Well, you can also add keyless entry, a soft door closing system, window sun blinds, an electric steering column, climate cooled front seats that can also feature powered lumbar support, a digital TV tuner, four zone climate control, configurable ambient lighting, and an in control secure vehicle tracking system. Fully powered electric front seats cost extra on the mainstream models too. Uh, for the colder months, you might also want to consider the cold climate pack, which gives you a heated steering wheel, heated rear seats and a heated windscreen and these are all items that can be ordered separately. There's also an optional timed climate with remote heat system which will preheat the cabin for you. Uh, the saloon body style can be ordered with a more conventional sunroof and a powered boot lid. Practicalities include the usual roof racks and carriers for skis, snowboards and racks for up to three bikes, plus a tow bar, of course, which can be specified in electrically deployable form. Now, unfortunately, you'll have to pay extra for a space saver spare wheel if, in the event of a puncture, you don't want to be left by the side of the road struggling with a tyre repair kit. Uh, sport brake customers will want to look at the practical 320 litre roof box and maybe also the full height dog guard and a boot liner with fold out bumper protectors. For saloon buyers, there's plenty of optional stuff so you can make better use of the boot, a collapsible boot space organiser, a rubber low space liner and side and floor nets. 
Across the range for the cabin, there are side window sun blinds, extra power sockets, seat back storage pouches, a headrest mounted coat hangers, a central rear armrest chiller warmer box, and iPad holders that allow you to attach tablets to the back of the front headrests. Use those in combination with the optional white fire headphones, and you'll certainly be able to keep the kids quiet on longer journeys. As for aesthetic touches, well, to start with, do bear in mind that you're probably going to be paying your Jaguar dealer extra for your chosen paintwork, since solid white and black are the only shades that come as standard. In this case, we've got Santorini black, and that's one of a range of metallic colours. Uh, there's also a couple of eye-wateringly expensive premium palette shades. A uh, wide choice of alloy wheels of between 17 and 20 inches in size are available to complement your chosen panel work. Here, for example, we've got the optional 20 20 inch nine split spoke contrast finish rims. Uh, rear privacy glass is optional. And the carbon fiber or gloss black finishing that you can get for the door mirrors and the side power vents may appeal to some. There's also a black pack which gives your XF a meaner look with exterior gloss black finishing. And you can add a boot spoiler to the saloon model too. For the uh, inside, there's a wide range of veneers and finishes with different headliners and interior inlays in gloss black, carbon fibre or various wood finishes. On an automatic model, we'd want the aluminium gear shift paddles to replace the awful standard plastic items. On to safety, where, as you'd expect, most of the main bases are covered. Now, Jaguar hasn't bothered with offering a driver's knee bag, but twin front, side and curtain airbags are inevitably standard, along with Isofix rear child seat fastenings, a tyre pressure monitoring system, a brake pad wear indicator, anti-whiplash head restraints and a pedestrian-friendly bonnet, which is clever enough to rise in a collision to better protect vital organs. Uh, the usual electronic assistance for traction and stability control will hopefully make that kind of nightmare scenario much less likely plus as usual there's abs braking with emergency brake assist to aid in panic stops and those are advertised to following motorists by automatically activating hazard flashes also fitted across the range is an autonomous emergency braking system which scans the road ahead in search of potential collision hazards as you drive. Uh, now, if one's detected, you'll be warned. If you don't respond or perhaps you aren't able to, then braking will automatically be applied to decrease the severity of any resulting accident. In addition, all XF models get a lane departure warning system which will alert dozy drivers if they're veering out of their lanes on the highway and a traffic sign recognition system which will picture a key road signs as you pass them and then display them on the dash. Now this can also work with an adaptive speed limiter to automatically adjust your speed to suit those signs. Now if you're a tower then you'll appreciate the trailer stability control setup which will help to keep things steady should you specify a tow bar and make regular use of it. And finally we particularly approve of the infotainment system's standard in control protect feature which uh, will connect you through to assistance in the event of a break down or an accident and will also automatically summon help to your exact GPS location if the airbags deploy. That could be a lifesaver. If you want to go further, there are various additional options. And our Jaguar hasn't got around yet to offering XF buyers a kind of limited autonomous driving technology that you'll find provided by obvious rivals. But all that aside, most of the usual camera and radar driven technology can be added on should you want it. Highway driving can be made safer thanks to a package giving you a lane keep assist that if necessary, imperceptibly tweaks the steering to keep you in your designated lane. And a driver condition monitor, which will evaluate your reactions as you drive and if it detects drowsiness it'll alert you to stop for a restorative coffee. Another package stops you from uh, dangerously pulling out at speed in front of another vehicle thanks to a lane change merge aid and a blind spot monitor system. Plus it also includes a reverse traffic detect feature to alert you to the presence of oncoming vehicles if you're reversing out of a space. If you, or more likely your company, can afford to stretch even further to make your XF into even more of a safe haven, then there's an optional ACC, Adaptive Cruise Control Package, for the auto gearbox models. Now this uses a radar to automatically keep you a safe distance from the car in front at cruising speeds, and it's even able to apply emergency braking if it detects an impending collision. The ACC package includes a forward alert feature to warn you if you're getting too close to the car in front, and there's a Q-Assist 
feature that you can set in a traffic jam so that the car can handle irritating, very low speed stop-start motoring without driver intervention. To get adaptive cruise control and all those associated features, you'll need to specify your XF with the optional active safety pack, which also includes the blind spot monitor, uh, the reverse traffic detection, lane keep assist, and the driver condition monitor features that we mentioned earlier. The fuel and CO2 returns of this second generation XF are, as you expect, in a different league from those of the previous model. Now, unfortunately for Jaguar, though, the same can be said to an even greater degree when it comes to obvious competitors. It's now the norm for a car in this class to return over 55 mpg on the combined cycle and under 130 grams per kilometer of CO2. In fact, some contenders in this class can almost sip fuel like a super mini. One of the things that prevents the XF from delivering that kind of showing is that it weighs slightly more than some of its rivals, which is surprising given the supposedly lightweight aluminium intensive architecture that the brand makes so much of. There's nothing wrong with the Ingenium engine technology though, incorporating as it does so-called efficient turbocharging, central direct high pressure fuel injection, variable valve timing, uh, computer control for the oil and water pumps, and of course an engine start stop system. The petrol units get particulate filters and the diesels feature a sophisticated EGR exhaust gas recirculation feature plus the usual SCR, selective catalytic reduction technology which works with an AdBlue additive uh, to cut NOx to very low levels. All the tech boxes seem to have been ticked then, so what does it all translate into when it comes to the actual returns this car can deliver? Well, all the readings that we're going to quote you from here on in this section relate to the sport brake body shape, since that's what we're driving here. Now, obviously, you'll do a fraction better with the slightly lighter saloon body style. The best showing that you'll be able to get is up to 55.4 mpg on the combined cycle and up to 134 grams per kilometer of CO2. But since those figures apply to the 2 litre diesel 163 PS manual gearbox model that very few customers choose, they're somewhat irrelevant. Almost all XF customers want automatic transmission and they typically start their search with the 180 PS version of the 2 litre diesel. Now that combination with this sport brake body style gets you a combined cycle return of 49.6 mpg and a CO2 reading of up to 150 grams per kilometre. Returns which are far less eye-catching, especially when compared to some key rivals. Even so, there's still enough to give you a pretty extensive 850 mile driving range. And that's enough, for example, to get you from Coventry to Munich without filling up. If you want to look at the more powerful black pump fuel diesel options, uh, then we'll tell you that the twin turbo four cylinder two litre 240 PS diesel manages up to 55.4 mpg and up to 134 grams per kilometre. It's not bad considering this variant has to be had with four wheel drive. Um, here we're trying the rear driven three litre 300 PS V6 diesel, which delivers up to 46.3 mpg on the combined cycle and up to 160 grams per kilometre. As for the two Ingenium four-cylinder petrol models, well, the rear-driven 250 PS variant manages up to 37.2 mpg on the combined cycle and up to 173 grams per kilometer of CO2. For the all-wheel drive twin turbo 300 PS model, you're looking at up to 36.2 mpg and up to 178 grams per kilometer of CO2. Uh, for reasons best known to Jaguar, the petrol models get a larger 74 litre fuel tank that's eight litres larger than is offered in the diesel variants. Now, all the figures we just quoted assume that you've chosen the most frugal of the four Jaguar drive control modes, Eco, for your trip, and that's a setting that, as the name suggests, adjusts all the car's systems for maximum efficiency. Beyond that, your driving is clearly going to play a crucial part in the efficiency process, something this XF's technology wants to help you improve. Uh, the in-control touch infotainment screen's Eco data section offers a driving style display to help here, and that shows you your recent efficiency success when it comes to three areas, accelerator, speed and engine, and brake. Uh, there's a history screen which shows how your running cost figures stack up, and an energy display which shows you how much the use of uh, features like the air conditioning is costing you in terms of consumption. 
What else? Uh, well, you get the usual unremarkable three-year warranty, although to be fair, it does cover you for up to 100,000 miles. And service intervals are every uh, 21,000 miles or every 24 months, which comes first. Although it would be sensible to consider one of Jaguar's service plans, which cover you for virtually everything in advance. Uh, there's a standard mileage service plan, which covers you for five years and 50,000 miles, or a high mileage service plan, which covers five years and 75,000 miles. Both packages include engine oil and filters, uh, checking and topping up brake fluid, and a 24-month guarantee on any replacement parts. Should anything go wrong, Europe-wide breakdown assistance is part of the deal for three years. Now, let's look at insuring this Jaguar. The 163 PS diesel is rated at Group 25, while the 180 PS model is rated at Group 27 in rear rim form, or either Group 28 or 29 in all-wheel drive, guys. The 240 PS all-wheel drive diesel variant rates at Group 33 or 34, depending on spec. Uh, this 3-litre V6 diesel rates at Group 41 or Group 42 if you go for the sportier-looking S-spec version. As for the petrol variants, well, the base 250 PS model rates at Group 32 or 33, while the all-wheel drive 300 PS model rates at Group 35 or 36. As for depreciation, well, the news is almost universally positive here. Independent experts reckon that after the usual industry standard three-year, 60,000-mile ownership period, uh, the volume 2-litre diesel 180 PS models will be worth between 33 and 35% of their original asking price, which is very competitive against premium opposition. Uh, as a result, despite its so-so efficiency showing, an XF should still be very cost-effective to lease for both company and private drivers. Uh, that's whether they choose Jaguar's own scheme or one of the many others on offer. There are three real eras in Jaguar history. The earliest one still supports it today. A time of Sir William Lyons and Inspector Morse, of classic cars and legendary exploits at Le Mans. The second era was less notable, full of models that disappointed the brand and its buyers, thanks to management decisions which placed style over substance. Back in 2007, the first generation XF250 series version of this car brought that period to a close, promising a new, more relevant, more dynamic and crucially more competitive era for the Coventry company. Without that very first XF, you wonder where Jaguar might be today. In evaluating this, that model's successor, you wonder just how far the brand can go in the future. On this showing, there are certainly grounds for great optimism. The classic flowing looks really work, particularly with this sport brake estate body style. And thanks to its uh, sophisticated aluminium architecture, its smart, spacious cabin, and its efficient range of Ingenium engines, this car will worry the German makers more than any model Jaguar has brought us so far. But then, perhaps we should have expected that based on the company's recent near-flawless record under Indian ownership. Investment from Tata goes in, excellent cars come out. It does seem to be as simple as that. Except that it isn't. There's nothing simple about producing a car as good as this one. A model that matches exacting class standards in many areas and leads its segment in terms of its beautifully judged ride and handling balance. True, it might not be the game changer its predecessor was, but then it doesn't need to be. That corner had already been turned. The old XF showed how Jaguar could compete on equal terms with its Teutonic rivals. This car, though, demonstrates clearly how it means to go about beating them. Other issues? A few. Despite improvements to this car in terms of media connectivity, camera-driven safety provision and autonomous driving tech, it can't quite match its key premium rivals in any of those areas. And we were a little disappointed that the aluminium intensive structure hasn't delivered more in terms of the kind of weight saving that would have really allowed this car to maximise the benefits of its Ingenium engine technology. Now, much of this is down to the fact that Jaguar can't bankroll investment in these areas in the same way that its key competitors can. Now, the brand is, after all, still, in global terms, a minor player compared to its Teutonic rivals. But that also allows its products to be deliciously different, as this one is. It builds on what was good about the original XF, it adds lifestyle touches that you simply can't get anywhere else, and it's British designed and built. Now, that last factor was one Jaguar once depended on for sales in our market. Today, it doesn't need to. And to understand the reason why, simply try one of these.